Welcome to another edition of Diplomacy Classroom. I'm Lauren Fisher with the National Museum of American Diplomacy, and I'm delighted to host this program today. I'm especially proud to represent the museum in commemorating World AIDS Day and to draw attention uh, to the disease which still remains a risk for people globally. The goal of our program today is to highlight how US diplomats engage in this issue and how they work with counterparts, both at home and abroad, to address this epidemic. For today's discussion about AIDS, I am delighted to have with me today Nita Bandari, who serves as the Deputy Director of the Private Sector Engagement Team in the State Department's Office of the U.S. Global AIDS Coordinator. She has done extraordinary work with AIDS, and so we are very fortunate to have her with us today as we unpack how the State Department and other federal agencies address this virus. Um, but before we get started, I just want you to know we will be taking questions at the conclusion of Nita's presentation. So feel free to enter in your thoughts and your comments in the comment box on your screen. And I want to make sure that all of you watching today are following the museum on our social media platforms at NAMAD Museum. Uh, we would love to make sure that you are aware of future programs. Um, and for those of you who don't know, the mission of the National Museum of American Diplomacy is to share and celebrate the stories of American diplomacy, the history, the practice, the challenges. And we do so through our exhibits, both in the museum and online, through our artifact collection and stories and through programs like this. Our job is also to help our audiences better understand the function and the role of the State Department and how we work with other federal agencies to engage in global issues that impact our nation's health and prosperity. And so for those of you um, listening and, and as you think about sharing the content that we're going to discuss today with your networks, I want to make sure that you are aware of other resources that the museum has on our website that will supplement some of the things that we're going to uh, talk about today. So I'm going to quickly toggle over to our website, which is diplomacy.state.gov. So please remember that. Visit our website, diplomacy.state.gov. Here you see our home screen. And an image of our Diplomacy is Our Mission exhibit, which is um, installed in our beautiful glass pavilion. And you see some of uh, the toolbar at the top. And I'm just going to quickly go to our Education tab and go to our Resources at a glance, if I can get over there. Education, Resources at a glance, because it's here that, there we go. It's here that we've kind of centralized some basic information, introductory information about the State Department, uh, the nature of diplomacy, what it is, the work of our US diplomats, um, the kinds of roles that they, they play abroad. And then you also see we have <clears throat> some videos on the right and those videos take you and transport you abroad where you meet diplomats and you hear about their work. You see also an opportunity to join our mailing list, so please sign up. And then we also have some videos of subject matter experts that explore uh, additional global issues and how our diplomats work on them abroad. If you work with audiences and you want to engage them in this content, and if you want to engage them in <clears throat> the practice of diplomacy, we have our diplomacy simulation program, and I want to pop over there because we do have a simulation uh, which focuses on HIV AIDS. Uh, these are hypothetical simulations that invite students or participants to play the role of a diplomat, to exercise those skills of diplomacy, inviting them to work together to address a global crisis. In this case, it is an HIV AIDS crisis. So everything that we're going to discuss today on uh, with Nita is really great background information that you can um, share with your students. You can replay the video for them as you work with them to exercise those skills of a, of a diplomat and um, put them in those roles where they have to find that common ground and seek solution to that crisis. So diplomacy.state.gov, please visit and explore all the, uh, all the wonderful resources that we have here today. 
All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And it's at this point that I would love to invite to the screen Nita Bandari. Nita, are you there? Hi, Nita, how are you? How are you? Thank you so much for joining us today. I know that this is a busy day for you. It's World AIDS Day. So thank you for taking the time to share with our audiences the nature of your work. Um, you work in our office of, global, of the Global AIDS Coordinator. And I know prior to that, you were a program manager for PEPFAR. Um, and you're gonna talk a little bit more about PEPFAR in your presentation. But that you, you managed the West African portfolio for PEPFAR. So you were really looking at AIDS in the Western part of Africa. And then prior to that, you were in the private sector. You were with an NGO where you were working on and living in Nairobi and sort of focusing on AIDS um, in Africa. So you really know this, this, um, this subject well. And although there's other viruses dominating the headlines, when we think about World AIDS Day, why is this important to you? Great. Thanks, Lauren. And first of all, just thanks so much to you and your team at the National Museum of American Diplomacy for inviting me here to speak. I'm really delighted um, to be here with you. Mm -hmm. So great question. You know, why is World AIDS Day important? Um, well, I think you'll, you'll come to see as I talk over the next few minutes that HIV AIDS is still a very significant issue globally. And it's really important for us to keep focus and attention and investment on addressing this epidemic. Um, we've also made some tremendous gains over the last three decades on the response to HIV. And we continue, we need to continue reminding the world um, that this is still very much an issue. Um, but I think it's important to also commemorate the gains that we have made um, and, and really honor those that we have also lost uh, due to this epidemic. So mm -hmm. I think that World AIDS Day really helps to draw that continued focus while, um, while also celebrating the hard work that has gone into addressing the epidemic to date. Excellent. And I know that you've put some slides together that I think will provide our audience with some great visuals and thinking about the content. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again um, and pull up those slides, which I have right here. Just gonna move a couple things around so our audience can see a full view of, of the images that you put together for us today. All right. Thank you. Yeah, here we go. Hey, so, um, so I'm gonna be telling you a little bit about the HIV AIDS epidemic, and then I'll talk about the US government's response to the epidemic through PEPFAR, and then also how we um, specifically work with the private sector to accomplish our goals. Great. Next slide, please. Um, so the Office of the U.S. Global AIDS Coordinator sits within the Department of State and it's responsible for implementing PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. And PEPFAR is really responsible for responding to the global HIV AIDS epidemic. And it's the largest commitment by any nation to address a single disease in history. So for those of you um, that are tax paying citizens, thank you because you are very much contributing um, to this response. Next slide, please. So just to kind of paint the picture, this is what the world looked like before PEPFAR was created. Um, we had about 30 million people living with HIV and 10,000 new infections daily, globally in 2001. And there were less than a million people on treatment globally and even less than 50,000 on treatment in Sub-Saharan Africa, which is where the disease burden was and frankly still is highest. We saw life expectancy decline by over 20 years in the high burden countries. And there was a loss of the working age population. There were also child led head of households, which really started to create a lot of instability and susceptibility. Mm -hmm. So health systems were really overwhelmed by this epidemic. Next slide, please. Yeah. And so in 2003, PEPFAR was launched um, by President George W. Bush and has continued um, throughout the course um, to date under leadership through um, President Barack Obama and, and also President Donald Trump. And so there sort of have been three um, phases of PEPFAR, if you will. Um, PEPFAR 1, as we call it, um, under President Bush, was really, as I mentioned, about an emergency response to save lives. 
AIDS was a security issue then. And so um, PEPFAR was created to really rapidly deliver HIV prevention treatment and treatment services. Um, and there was a lot of focus on the late stage illness. So those that were really dying from AIDS and trying to get those um, people that had AIDS onto treatment as quickly as possible. We then moved into PEPFAR 2.0 um, under President Obama. And that was more about sort of a, a shared responsibility to the response with national governments. Um, and so there was really a focus on country driven programs. And there was a, a focus on ensuring that we were um, trying to get to an AIDS free generation. So trying to ensure that babies were being born HIV free. And there was also a lot of focus under this phase on building and strengthening health systems to deliver HIV services. We then moved into PEPFAR 3.0, which is where we are now. Um, and the focus under PEPFAR 3.0 has really been on making um, data-driven decisions. So looking at granular data, looking at the quality of services, oversight, transparency, accountability, and really trying to get to increasing efficiency in how we are making an impact. So we're accelerating our core interventions, trying to get countries to epidemic control, and I'll explain what that is in a, in a minute or two, um, and ensuring that um, we are putting everyone that is HIV positive on treatment. There's really a focus also on sustainability and the sustainability agenda, but again, based on data. Um, what I think has been particularly notable is that PEPFAR has always had strong bipartisan support. It's been through nine Congresses and three administrations, and it continues to deliver a very comprehensive approach in HIV prevention, treatment, and care. Excellent. It's really great to have that history because this is as much about sort of learning where we've come from and where we're going and understanding um, HIV AIDS. So that, that was great. So why is effort still needed in the response? Well, I hope this visual can explain why very quickly. Um, and, and this data is a few years old, but I think it's, it's still quite relevant. Um, there is still a high burden of disease in many countries around the world. And you can see particularly those that are in dark blue mm -hmm. um, that have the highest burden of disease. And you'll see that those are particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa. Mm -hmm. So we are aligning our investment to the HIV burden around the world, um, which is why we operate in, in, in basically all of these countries. So we work in over 50 countries, most of which are in Sub-Saharan Africa where the burden's highest. Next slide, please. So we are now focused on the sustainable uh, control of the HIV epidemic and improving outcomes for people living with HIV. And we're achieving this through what's called the 90-90-90 UN AIDS strategy. Um, and so this is a strategy that was developed by the United Nations member states. Um, and what it is, is it aims to have 90% of all people living with HIV um, to be tested and to know their status. 90% of all of those with a diagnosis that's HIV positive to receive treatment and to be put onto antiretroviral treatment. And 90% of those on treatment to reach viral load suppression. And even better is if they get to a point where their viral, viral load is undetectable, that means that they actually can't then pass on uh, the virus to others. So this is the strategy and, and the goals that were set um, a few years ago. And really PEPFAR is supporting countries to meet their 90-90-90 goals and to achieve epidemic control. And when I say epidemic control, what I mean, um, we define epidemic control as when the number of new infections is less than the number of deaths due to AIDS. Got it, great. Next slide. So this is how we as PEPFAR um, are responding in, in terms of our goals for the response. So firstly, we want to sustain the gains in countries that have already achieved epidemic control. We then want to accelerate control in the handful of countries that are just on the brink of getting to control. Um, and then thirdly, to address the, rise, uh, the rising new infections in key populations around the world as well. And I think I'll just add here also that 
Um, you know, we're certainly not doing this alone, and you'll hear how we're doing this in partnership with others. But even within the U.S. government, this is very much a whole of government approach. So we work closely with USAID, CDC, um, DOD, the Department of Labor, Peace Corps, Department of Treasury, and of course with other areas of state as well. So this really is um, a, a whole of government approach. Great, excellent. Next slide, please. So I think all of you listening will probably find this most interesting. Um, in order for us to achieve these goals, I think we have really learned over the years that policies and political will really matter. And so PEPFAR has leveraged its financial investments and the robust, um, robust global U.S. embassy support around the world to engage with heads of state, prime ministers, ministers of health and finance, really across all of the PEPFAR countries to ensure that the policies that are set up, for example, by um, the, the World Health Organization, WHO, are being adopted in the countries and then also being implemented down to the site level. And so these diplomatic engagements have really helped to move countries to treat all of their HIV AIDS patients. And that has addressed a lot of patient concerns that existed in the past over the cost of treatment over, over the medicines. Um, and this has involved a very multi-sectoral approach. So, you know, working with community-based organizations, faith-based organizations, civil society, multilateral organizations, you know, other parts of U.S. government, as I mentioned, but also having bilateral discussions, um, again, with ministries of health, ministries of finance, and, and heads of state. So... Um, I was just going to say that, um, you know, in the museum, we think about diplomacy as building and maintaining relationships. Mm -hmm. And this sounds like this is in the broadest sense where it's not just with, you know, another country or many countries, but also sort of on the, on the local level as well with organizations and, and civil society. Absolutely. And community organizations. Yeah. Um, absolutely right. And, and I will say all of this really kind of to summarize says that you know, PEPFAR and our response to the epidemic has served as a diplomacy tool as well. And just like you're saying, Lauren, down to the community level. Yeah, wow, excellent. Great, next slide. So um, I made these slides before we announced our results today. Um, and Ambassador Burks actually announced our mm -hmm. most recent results as of the end of September. So I do encourage you to go look at um, the State Department website um, where PEPFAR has its most recent results posted. But um, as of mid-2020, these were our results. They've gone up now. All to say that we have really achieved a lot uh, to date. We have put over 17 million people on treatment. Um, we have performed over 25 voluntary medical male circumcisions, which is a way to help prevent HIV or mitigate HIV risk in males. Um, we have put, you know, six, we supported six and a half, over six and a half million orphans and vulnerable children mm -hmm. with critical care and support. And um, what's been particularly exciting, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, is our DREAMS partnership, which is actually a public-private partnership, um, has really played a big role. We have um, had a decline in HIV diagnosis amongst adolescent girls and young women in all of our DREAMS districts, and by greater than 40% in nearly two-thirds of where DREAMS, the partnership, operates. So really some tremendous results. Congratulations, yeah, absolutely. Next slide, please, great. So we, you know, while we continue to face challenges in the response, because there's always challenges, of course, um, there have been, there are some really great opportunities that still lie ahead. For the first time ever, we have the potential to control an epidemic um, for the first time in modern history without a vaccine or a cure. Mm. Uh, but our success really does depend on the effectiveness and efficiency of implementation and, and really having data-driven implementation. Um, we also believe that the current and future breakthroughs we've seen scientifically will accelerate um, the elimination, hopefully maybe one day the eradication mm -hmm. of HIV. Um, and finally, we can certainly leverage our response to HIV to address other global health threats. And we're seeing that today with COVID especially. And it's because we understand the linkages between global health and other U.S. foreign policy objectives to increase economic prosperity and promote peace and security, PEPFAR's global health diplomacy efforts have really extended beyond just HIV AIDS. Mm -hmm. um, and our investments to strengthen global health security and health systems delivery have laid the groundwork 
for um, the U.S. government's response to COVID as well. Oh, excellent. Yes, I mean, what we all now know is that viruses don't know borders, and so they they travel, they don't discriminate. And so it's really important that we're working together to kind of address it. Absolutely. So we cannot do any of this alone. Um, as PEPFAR, as US government even, we need partnerships. And we need partnerships with host country governments. We need partnerships with multilateral institutions, as we talked about faith-based, community mm -hmm civil society, and certainly with the private sector as well. Um, and, and just to, to also further clarify, when we talk about private sector, we define private sector as any entity that's not government. Um, so for-profit companies, foundations, technically even NGOs. Um, but as I'm talking over the next few slides on private sector, I'll really kind of be referring more to the for-profit um, companies that we work with and the foundations as well. Great. Um, so why do we partner with the private sector? Well, when PEPFAR is struggling with a challenge, we go to the private sector for new approaches and new ideas. And we use partnerships to really support achievement of country program goals in an effective and efficient way. And so we build public-private partnerships, or PPPs as we call them, to first and foremost increase our impact, um, again, in an efficient way but also to innovate and um, try new things. You know, the private sector can take greater risks sometimes than, than we can as US government. Um, so that makes partnership really important. We also use partnerships to accelerate progress, to go faster and to expand scale, reach and coverage to go further. Um, we also use private sector partnerships to complement our own programming. So to fill gaps and to have partners, um, private sector partners, invest in complementary complementary areas to our programming where we may not necessarily be able to directly invest. Um, and then, of course, to sustain success, which is really important. So because PEPFAR in 3.0 is really focused on uh, data collection, mm -hmm. does that make, because now you have sort of the data and the numbers to back up what you need, does that make it so you can engage with um, a private partner a little bit more, you know, easily? Absolutely. Um, so, you know, with private sector, and especially with companies, you know, oftentimes they respond really well to numbers. And so um, having a data driven kind of business case, if you will, to go and approach private sector partners with certainly makes the conversation, I think, a little bit easier. Um, and I think having that data driven focus also shows that we as PEPFAR are trying to be more you know, business-like in the sense mm. and to be more efficient ourselves with how we are using every single dollar of, of, of the taxpayers. That's what I was going to say. It makes it easier to report to the Hill on how, how, you know, how it's going and what you've been able to achieve. Absolutely. Great. Yeah. So here, you know, what is it that the private sector can bring to the table? Mm -hmm. So here you will see, I have a list, I won't go through all of them, but um, these are some of the skill sets that we really rely on the private sector to bring to the table when we are creating partnerships. Um, you know, skill sets in marketing and public relations and communications and supply chain and distribution, innovation and technology. Um, these are just some of the core competencies that we really do value and rely on our private sector partners to bring. You know, financial resources are nice, certainly, um, but these skill sets we find are even more valuable to PEPFAR. Great. Excellent. Yeah, those are some really um you know specific things that they bring that i would want all, everyone to sort of take a look at this slide because as i know when our students enact the simulation these are some very specific mm -hmm. um, um you know skills as well as tasks or do outs that can be um, discussed in some kind of like a simulation or a problem solving Absolutely. um yeah problem solving exercise great Okay, so these last three slides or so, um, I'll just give you some examples of some of the partnerships that we currently have in place. Um, so as I mentioned, when we're struggling with a particular challenge, we'll go to the private sector for some new ideas or approaches. Our data has really allowed us to understand 
which population groups were missing in terms of reaching effectively with our programming. And as a result, we formed many global public-private partnerships around specific population groups, including mm -hmm. adolescent girls and young women, adult men, children, et cetera. Um, so you'll see here three partnerships that are listed. As I mentioned, DREAMS is a public-private partnership that focuses on HIV prevention among adolescent girls and young women. Um, we brought the private sector in to, uh, to help us uh, address HIV infection among this very vulnerable group. We also partner with uh, companies to screen for cervical cancer in HIV positive women through mm -hmm. our Go Further partnership. Mm -hmm. um, and finally, on Together for Girls, we partner to look at addressing gender-based violence amongst adolescent girls and young women, which we know is also a structural driver of the epidemic. Mm -hmm. Wow, okay. Next slide, please. Um, likewise, a few years ago, we realized that adult men were also a, a, a sort of a missing population that we weren't reaching, I think, adequately enough. Um, and so we formed a partnership called MenStar to reach men using private sector consumer marketing expertise. Uh, we also have a partnership with a pharmaceutical company um, that focuses on getting men to test for HIV using hypertension as an entry point. Mm -hmm. um, and that's with a company um, that has a program called Healthy Heart Africa. Wow, excellent, thank you. And finally, um, we've had many different partnerships over the years, frankly, and efforts to explicitly focus on children. Mm -hmm. uh, most recently, we uh, have been a part of a series of high-level dialogues with leaders of pharmaceutical and medical technology companies um, and the Vatican, multilateral organizations, donors, governments, um, and, and a lot of other partners and key stakeholders to address pediatric HIV AIDS um, diagnosis and treatment. Wow. And we've also had partners, uh, partnerships to strengthen systems, as I had, had mentioned at the beginning, um, lab systems in, in particular. And so we have two lab uh, strengthening partnerships, which will be transitioning over the, over the next year or so, but they've been extremely successful and important in ensuring that we are strengthening the ability to diagnose um, HIV and NTB um, and, and really strengthening those systems as well. So I will go ahead and stop there because um, I'm sure people have lots of questions. Yeah, well, and I just want to say, indeed, a lot of accomplishments, absolutely, just tremendous what has been achieved in the 20, or, you know, 20 years or so. Um, but I just, I just, before we switch to some questions, um, I wanted to ask a question because no one wants AIDS, right? There's been a lot done, but no, no one wants it in their locale, in their country, in their family. Um, and so there's a lot of opportunities that you've mentioned that we can work together to, uh, you know, eradicate and address um, the virus. But you also mentioned there's challenges, and I thought maybe you could kind of speak to that. What are the challenges that currently face your work? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, Absolutely, there are definitely significant challenges. There are challenges around stigma, around discrimination. Those continue to be very um, prevalent in, in, you know, throughout the world. Um, you know, people living with HIV continue to face stigma and discrimination in, in many communities and in many countries. Um, so that's one significant challenge that continues to exist. But I think what um, what has been what has been really interesting, and I, I've thought a lot about this myself also, is, you know. Over the course of, of the response um, over the last you know, 18, 19 years, um, our clients that we're serving have, have actually changed. So our client looks a little bit different today than they did maybe even say 10 years ago. So what do I mean by that? What I mean is that you know, 10 years ago or so, or even more, our clients were very sick. The people that we were trying to serve were extremely ill, especially in that first phase, phase one that I mentioned of PEPFAR. Mm -hmm. They felt sick, um, they oftentimes looked sick, and, and they were in, in late stage of, of really of the disease. Um, so they were willing to mm -hmm you know, travel kilometers and kilometers to get to the nearest clinic. They were willing to sit in a crowded clinic and wait potentially half a day or more to see a doctor that would give them, you know, life-saving treatment and medicines. And they were willing and, and they adhered to taking those drugs and then came back again, you know, a month later to pick up their next round. Um, and so that was the client that we were treating then. The client that we're actually serving now 
looks a little bit different. We're actually serving the well now, right? Um, and I put that in quotes because they mm -hmm. might actually um, have HIV and not know it first and foremost. Mm -hmm. They don't feel sick. They are young. The data is showing us that our um, our clients that are you know becoming increasingly infected are the under 35s, um, and so they are not necessarily willing to travel kilometers to get to the nearest clinic. They're not necessarily willing to sit in a in a clinic and wait half a day to be seen. They're worried about having jobs. You know, maybe they have jobs that they have to be at. So, so we're we're really. Um, we're, we're serving a different patient now. And what that has meant is that we have needed to also change how we deliver our services to our clients. Um, and so what we're starting to do now is deliver services in a very client-centric way. So understanding the needs and the preferences of our clients and ensuring that we are serving them in a way that is uh, convenient and, um, and effective, mm -hmm. and that we are bringing the services to them instead of necessarily expecting them to come wow. to, um, to the services. And so I think that has, it has been a challenge, and I think that we realize that, and now we're starting to address that by trying to make our services more client-centered. Wow, excellent. Well, this first question that I'm gonna read actually kind of, it, it speaks to the stigma um, that you mentioned earlier. For the countries around the world that have a stigma surrounding AIDS, what are the diplomacy tools that have most helped to eliminate that stigma? Yeah. So again, as I mentioned, stigma continues to be a problem. Um, you know, one of the one of the it's it's a, technically a scientific tool, but I think also can be considered a diplomacy tool um, that we have been talking a lot about is this concept of U equals U. And, and I sort of alluded to this earlier, which is undetectable equals untransmittable. So when an HIV positive um, person is on treatment and adhering to their treatment as they should, um, we hope that they get to a point where they uh, are, their viral load is undetectable. When they're undetectable, they are untransmittable, which means that they can't pass the virus on to others. Um, and so the reason this is important is because it starts to address a little bit of that stigma issue, right? That, that issue of, oh, you know, if I'm HIV positive, I might spread the virus to others, right? And, and that creates stigma, it creates discrimination, et cetera. And so this concept of U equals U um, is something that we are trying to uh, promote in, in the communities and at the community level. And again, the, the diplomacy comes in in leveraging um, the incredibly strong relationships that we have all around the world at that community level mm -hmm. um, and ensuring that we are sending the right kinds of messages through those platforms and mechanisms mm -hmm. down to the community, um, mm -hmm. to the community level. Mm -hmm. And just like you equals you, as well as the fact that if you are on treatment, you can live a happy, normal, healthy life being HIV positive. Thank you. Okay, another question. It's a little similar. How does education and behavior modification uh, teachings help in the prevention of AIDS? So that has been one of the strongest um, tool prevention tools for us, um, which is really bringing about awareness, education, um, education, not only on the, the actual sort of biomedical um, issues, if you will, but also on the structural drivers, as I mentioned, right? Um, education, for example, or lack of education, that's one of the drivers of the epidemic. We have seen that in young women, especially, for example, um, if they are educated, they are less at risk of, of contracting HIV. And so um, I think it's, you know, it, it's really important to, um, to look at, at, at those elements as well as sort of the biomedical, but absolutely education serves as a, as a prevention tool, um, ensuring that we are continuing to um, remind people of how they can protect themselves and you know uh, what behaviors mm -hmm. 
put them at greatest risk of contracting HIV so that they can know how to mitigate those and, and protect themselves absolutely is, is very, very key. Um, and for change is extremely, extremely difficult, right? Um, we, we're kind of seeing that with the COVID pandemic today, right? We all have to change our behaviors. Yeah. We had to put on masks, we had to socially distance. Um, and that that was a behavior change that at the individual level that we all had to take on. Um, so behavior change can be tough, but that has absolutely served as one of the strongest ways that we have tried to um, mitigate the, uh, the effects of this epidemic. Great, thank you. Okay, how close to a vaccine are we to cure AIDS yeah. or eliminate AIDS? Yeah, that's a good question too. Um, you know, I'd like to say that we're 98% of the way there, but um, you know, the truth of the matter is we have been uh, investing, you know, globally as a global community. There has been and a scientific community. There has, has been a ton of work, um, as I mentioned, over the last three decades in trying to find a vaccine and trying to find a cure. Um, that work continues and, you know, there have been some, some really successful trials in the past. Um, we're not, you know, we're not there yet, but I, I do know that that work continues and it's really important work. And of course, we as PEPFAR are, uh, are in support of, of our colleagues that are working so hard to find a vaccine and cure. But that being said, in the meantime, you know, we really have had to, um, to say to ourselves, what can we do in the meantime? How can we effectively address Address this epidemic while we wait, frankly, for a, you know a cure or a vaccine. And we have all the tools that we need, as I mentioned, to yeah. get the epidemic under control. Um, so almost there, but you know. But it's it works uh, beautifully into the next question, which is what are some steps individuals can take to prevent the spread of AIDS? Yeah. So I mean, you know, I think first and foremost, um, what we're doing today, which is educate. Right one another, ensuring that people know, you know, what HIV is, how it is, um, how it is, how it is transmitted, and what kinds of things an individual can do to, um, to really keep themselves uh, and to protect themselves from, from getting HIV. So I think education, first and foremost, is key. Um, educating, you know, yourselves, and then educating your, you know, fellow, fellow, um, you know, humans as well, fellow community members, fellow, fellow citizens. Um, I think making sure that we're all aware that this is still an issue and that it still exists and, and what are the right kinds of steps that an individual can take to protect themselves. I think that's, you know, very, that to me is the first step. Um, you know, I think for those of you that are abroad or that either live abroad or are going abroad or traveling abroad, I think, um, you know, you know, ensuring that you again are are um, aware and that you are continuing to spread um, the word of how you know this this epidemic still does exist, but um, that again there are life saving treatments available and that people can live healthy, normal, happy lives. Being HIV positive, I think that will really help particularly with the stigma, the discrimination that we talked about, particularly for those of you that are in, in the communities, you know, and, and working in, at the community level. I think that's really, really important as well. Um, and ensuring that people feel supported and, and know that, um, that they're not alone and that there are resources there to help them. To help them. Um, this is my last question to you. Um, so I'm looking at the time, but you know, at the museum, we really think about the skills of diplomacy and how our diplomats engage. And what I love about our conversation is you're really helping uh, to provide this connection between science, right, or a virus that really kind of looks at public health, but how diplomacy comes into that and where it's an important tool in uh, working with others around the world. So as a diplomat, um, and as you work with your counterparts, both in Washington, but also abroad, to you, what is the most, and this is personally, you, you know, a diplomatic skill that you feel is, is, has been uh, most effective or important to you in your doing your, in your work? Um, that's a fantastic question. You know, we as diplomats work across cultures and across a diverse amount of um, 
of, of, of cultures really and, and different thinking and different perspectives. And I think the ability to first and foremost build relationships um, and understand the lives that others are leading, I think that is something that I have really um, valued and learned through all the diplomacy work that I've done, is being able to embrace culture and understand um, that, that someone might have a different perspective on things than I do, but trying to find common ground and trying to find um, the ways that we can relate to one another first and foremost, and then to try to get to the goals that we're trying to achieve. And in this case, it's, it's you know, specifically around HIV AIDS, but really that ability to understand mm -hmm. not everyone is like me, not everyone has had an upbringing like me and, and being able to um, understand the di diversity of cultures that exist and how to then um, talk to one another, right? And how to have that dialogue in a way that is diplomatic, that is um, effective, that is efficient, but that also um, is really win-win. I think that for me has served me really well when I have some really tough conversations um, around this topic with, with uh, you know, with colleagues. So much to learn, really. Thank you so much for spending some time and really helping all of us better understand sort of the history. Um, and there's so much, in fact, to celebrate, as you've pointed out. And I want to congratulate you and all of your colleagues for the work that you've done on this and, and how you, you know, you protect us here at home by, by the work that you do. Um, so I want to thank you on behalf of everyone here today. Um, so thank you so much. And I want to remind our listeners that it is Giving Tuesday today. And so it's an opportunity for you to find that cause. That means, you know, that's important to you. And it's an opportunity to give not only money, but time and goods. And I know that the museum, we are working towards opening our permanent museum. Um, and you might find on our social media platforms today, um, sort of artifacts that have been donated to our collection and the generous gifts that our audiences have offered to us in being the first museum of diplomacy and celebrating the work um, that, that Nita is described here today. So you can learn about NAMAD and, and uh, how to donate to us by visiting diplomacycenterfoundation.org. We're also on the CFC, um, so feel free to, uh, to, to look into that. And I want to thank Nita for joining us today. Great. Thank you. And you bet. And we will see all of our diplomacy fans soon. Take care. Bye-bye.